Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Matt Hansen. I work for Element 84. I'm the geospatial engineering lead there. And today I'm going to talk about cloud native geospatial. So, first, I want to talk about this concept of a queryable Earth. Okay, so like these are actually often the questions it is that people want to know about our world. All right, like how many ships are in this port? Uh, how many buildings were built in my neighborhood? Uh, how many forests have been, you know, how many acres of, of uh, forest have been, have been deforested? These are the questions that we ultimately really it is that we're after. Notice what is missing from all of these questions. What's missing is the actual data source, right? We're not saying, oh, with MODIS data, we're going to do this, right? Like, that's ultimately, that's not really what it is that we're interested in. That's what we have to deal with as data scientists. We have to deal with MODIS or Landsat. But that's really not the end goal. So keep that in mind. So what is cloud-native geospatial? I'm going to be taking a sort of a big picture view here, so it's a little different than the previous, uh, previous talks. There'll be some overlap with that. Uh, and, I, and I just kind of want to talk about big picture, like what, what is it that we're talking about when we, when we talk about cloud native geospatial? And it's, it's Google Earth Engine. It really is what it is. Like you've all probably heard of Google Earth Engine. Uh, it's about having complete workflows in the cloud from data discovery through the processing, the analytics and the visualization. Like all of that happens through a lightweight client that the user is using. They have direct access to the data, but a lot of it is abstracted and it's transparent to the user. And Google Earth Engine is great. Like, you can, you type a script and you don't worry about individual scenes, you're not worrying about the data, you just can, like, create a mosaic over the entire world if you want to. And so, this is what cloud native geospatial is. You have direct access to the data, and this promotes scalability, of course, and reproducibility, data provenance, which I'll talk about and uh, online publishing. I like this concept of executable papers. I don't know if, you have, if any of you have heard this term. Um, I, I didn't make it up. Uh, I don't know where it originally came from, but it's this idea that rather than just publishing your paper in a journal, you actually publish something where there's a button and somebody can hit that button and they can open up your notebook, uh, your study in their own environment, like in, Google Cloud or in AWS or whatever it may be, and they can run it, and they would pay for that processing, but they can replicate it, right? Because there's a real re reproducibility problem in science. Uh, some estimates say that it is more than half of the papers actually can't be reproduced. And this is due to a large number of factors. Uh, the code is often not available. The data is hard to get to. You have to download individual uh, scenes and there's no way that you could take a, a, a really large scale uh, analytics paper and actually be able to reproduce that. So cloud native geospatial, I say, is really, it's a collection of standards and technologies for this easy access uh, the discovery and exploitation of the geospatial data and in, in the cloud, of course. Uh, except the problem with Google Earth Engine, right, is it's not open source. It's not based on any sort of standards. You can't deploy it yourself. Uh, you can't really easily integrate it with commercial providers, and you can't really extend it. Like, you can't build services on top of it. Now, I'm sure somebody from GE would come to me and say, no, actually, we can, you know, build services, but, like, that's not really the primary goal. It's about using their service. So... Cloud Native Geo is really about how, how do we take what, what Google Earth Engine did and turn that into an open source set of tools that now everybody can use. And there's a few different components of that. There's stack, there's cloud optimized data formats, and then there's this other thing, ARD, which I'm not gonna talk about today. I have a lightning talk tomorrow. It's sort of ill-defined. It doesn't really mean anything. If you wanna know more about what it doesn't mean, then you can come to my talk tomorrow afternoon. So let's talk about Stack, and people have been going in and out, so you might not have been at the previous two talks, but the, again, there'll be some overlap here. So let's take a look at AWS Open Data. So AWS has these great repositories of data online that are publicly available, and you can go to it and you can access the data. Sometimes it's a request or pays bucket, sometimes it's not, uh, but it's great because you have this data in, in cloud-optimized formats. The problem is that in order to find the data that you need, 
you, you kind of have to construct what that file name is. Like this is how you still have to do it with a lot of data sets. So you, you figure out the tile that you want and then you can construct what the file name is in this blob storage on S3 and then you can go and you can look and see what data is there. Well, that's just really not ideal at all because a lot of data is broken up into tiles and it might not completely be covered with data. And so my AOI is over here on the right hand side the data only covers the left-hand side. I spend all this time downloading the data, accessing it, and I have nothing at all. I've, I've, I've really just wasted my time. Uh, the NASA archive, as just one example of the explosion of data, right, is estimated to be over 250 petabytes um, in, in the next several years. The NISAR mission, uh, which is to be launched next year, is gonna have a downlink of 85 terabytes every day. So, that's just an explosion of data. So if your metadata isn't indexed in something that's searchable, then that data might as well not exist, right? People are not gonna be able to access it. And so a lot of metadata is indexed and it's available via these geo portals. And you can go to them and you could like download some data, right? This is like really anybody, any data scientist is like, yeah, this is the worst way, right, to actually get data. It's great as a demo, it's great maybe to like, get some funding, uh, but it's, it, this is really terrible. The, uh, most of these geoportals, of course, will be backed by an API, which is great, um, but there traditionally has been no, before Stack, there really wasn't any real consistency between all that. So, so back uh, at the state of the map in Boulder in 2017 is really where Stack started. It was called the imagery metadata spec there. And there was a bunch of organizations that were involved with that. And the requirements really were on how do we get metadata and allow users to do search and discovery in an easy way. We want to leverage other standards. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to replace existing metadata standards. We're not looking to replace some IEEE standard. Um, and we want the metadata to be crawlable. So this is a central idea behind the internet, right? Like the internet's crawlable. And so with Stack, the idea is that you can have static metadata and you can crawl it and index it. So it doesn't need to necessarily be in a database. It can be a bunch of static files. Therefore, you don't need to stand up any service. And then if you do want to search it, you, it can be crawled and then put into a database. And we also wanted a simple extensible course. So extensions, um, there's pros and cons to that approach, but the core of stack, we wanted to be really simple so that it would be stable. Um, I'll skip the timeline here. Uh, okay, so what is stack? Really briefly, there's catalogs, there's collections, there's items, and then down at the bottom there's assets. It's all in JSON, all of these entities are in JSON, again, it's crawlable. There's an API for querying, Catalogs are really just containers that point to other things. Collections are a way to group uh, typically seen, so like Landsat, that would be a collection. Sentinel-2, that would be a collection. The items are, an, are the actual individual scenes. So it's a collection of data files. It's more than one asset typically that's for a specific location at a specific date and time. So it's a when and a where. Although, if you have a mosaic, it could be a range of, of times, but it, the same idea uh, applies. So here's what, a, what a, a larger catalog might look like, right? You'll see that there's some grayed out catalogs. Those are just sub-catalogs. Those are for organizational purposes. You could organize uh, things this way. In an API, you really don't have this because uh, you really don't have these sub-catalogs because you can search. Uh, but in a static catalog, you might partition the data in various ways, such as when I showed before, there was the discovery by file name, things are separated by the tile location, and then the year, and then the month, and so on. And then down at the bottom, we have these assets. And, and that's why it's called the spatial temporal asset catalog, is because ultimately, it's the assets that we're after. That's the actual data that we want. So the stack specifications, they describe the geospatial data, that's the stack spec, and then how to search that data, that's the stack API spec. Uh, it was about a, over a year ago now that the version one was released. Uh, stack API spec is still uh, not on a 1.0 version, and it's because we're tied to, uh, it's, it's a longer story. Uh, but 
Um, we, we've been tying ourselves to OGC API. It's really built on the OGC API features. Uh, and so that was, that's been under development now. That has a 1.0 version. So we should be seeing a, a, an API spec version come out uh, shortly. Uh, so like I said, there's a simple core spec. This is GeoJSON, should be familiar to most people here. Uh, there's the geometry properties. You'll see the links and assets are something that might not be familiar to regular GeoJSON, and that's really kind of the crux of it right there. The assets is the actual data files. And links is really serve two purposes. You have hierarchical links, that's how we go up and down and are able to crawl catalogs, so an item will point back to its parent, its collection, and its root catalog, and so on. Uh, but it's also, um, we encourage judicious use of links to other things. It could be to documentation, or to a DOI, or, um, or code, additional code to use it. So uh, the links are, are critical. So it's a simple core spec. The complexity comes in with stack extensions. So there's a whole list of stack extensions. There's a GitHub organization, stack extensions.github.io. Uh, and it's really, it's open to anybody to add extensions. Um, the idea is that the, the marketplace will eventually win, is kind of the idea, right? Like stack extensions, anybody can implement an extension, anybody can put it in an item, it'll still going to be uh, compatible with software that's just looking at the core stack metadata. Uh, and over time, we'll see, oh, this extension is really useful, and this extension is useful, and that's where the best practices come in that Pete talked about earlier, is what are the sorts of extensions that we should be putting into, into Stack. And so some of the notable ones are the projection and raster extensions. Those are important for the ODC Stack software. Uh, and then we have some sensor-specific uh, extensions, like for SAR or for electro-optical to define spectral bands. Um, okay, and then I said the Stack API spec is based on the OGC API features uh, with just a couple search endpoints to do cross-collection searches is what, what that's for. Okay, cloud-optimized file formats. Going to switch gears a little bit. You've heard a lot about this, right? Cogs and Czar, this has been talked about. Cloud-optimized point clouds, GeoParquet. And I'm not going to talk about all these data formats. I just want to tell you about, like, what is it that makes something cloud-optimized? to begin with. So in a traditional file, you, in the default in GDAL would be you create something and there's these striped chunks. So now the important thing to know here is that each one of those chunks is compressed individually. Okay, so you can't read just a piece of a chunk. You have to read the whole chunk and then you decompress it and then you could pull out just the pixels that you need. And so if that's my AOI over there, then I need to read both those chunks, I need to decompress them, and then I can pull out the pixels that I need. So Cloud Optimize really just means that we have tiles that are more suited to the kinds of use cases that we want. And so if this is my AOI, I only have to read this one tile, and that's great. It's a lot less data that I have to read. So a cloud native data set is really one with small addressable chunks. That's it. it that's, it's as simple as that. Like people will talk about overviews, but that's, that's not strictly necessary. It's really about this central concept. It's a small addressable chunk. Now those chunks could be via internal tiles, like in the diagram that I showed, or in the case of Czar, they're actually individual files in blob storage. So it's, you, people might call it an exploded file format, where all of our tiles are actually individual um, blobs in blob storage, and so I can address each one of those, and I only have to download that. And that's it. The cool thing about uh, COGS, and the reason why it took off so much, is because it's, it's, TIFF is a really common format. And so this, Really, you can take old formats, this NetCDF and HDF, and there are now ways, there's a library called Kerchunk, to actually generate what all of those offsets are to all of the internal tiles and store that as a sidecar file. So now you can read NetCDF and HDF as if it was cloud optimized. And this is really cool because we can take legacy formats and we don't necessarily have to convert them and we can make them cloud optimized. Um, 
Matthias mentioned before the Kotar. This was actually a joke at this cloud outreach day that we had where somebody said, oh, cloud optimized tar file, and it turns out it actually existed. Somebody had made it. Uh, and, and, you know, we were just joking, uh, but you look into it, and it, of course, like, it's a cool idea. It's like it made sense for that use case is you have tar files, and you just have a sidecar file that says where in the file that you need to look for certain files and then certain chunks within those files. So it's not just about taking in one piece, right? Like I showed an AOI and it's like, oh, I can read this one, this one, little, one little piece of data. Um, but the, the real beauty, the scalability piece here is that if I use something like Dask, right? I'm using X-Array in my Python notebook and I have Dask, I have a bunch of Dask workers. Each one of those workers can now go and read a piece of the cog. And so this is really where the power comes in. It's not just for those people who just don't want to download a single file uh, and, and they just want an AOI. It's the fact that this huge file can be broken up into lots of little different AOIs and they can all be performed simultaneously. Uh, so OD stack, uh, ODC stack is, there's a, the Open Data Cube project from uh, that Geoscience Australia has been uh, pushing forward for years now. And this is a recent project um, that was funded by the Planetary Computer to essentially take the uh, Open Data Cube uh, code and rather than requiring a Postgres database, uh, it can now use stack metadata. So you could point this at a stack API, you could do a search, and now you can open this up as an X-ray. It's a great tool, uh, I suggest you use it. Um, all right, I just wanna like switch gears a little bit and talk about standards. So, because these are, we're t right here we're talking, these are standards, right? Like stack's a standard, sorta, is really a specification. Cog, that's a standard, but not really, it's a specification. What makes them standards? Like they're not backed by anything official. So some of you might have seen this XKCD comic, uh, which is a great comic, which I kind of disagree with a little bit because um, it's, it, there, there's competition here, right? Like, okay, you have 15 standards. It doesn't mean that they're all equal. So I, I drew this yesterday quickly just to get the idea across, but um, for successful standards, there's the keys are adoption and having a software ecosystem, and they feed each other, right? To have a successful standard, to take a specification and turn it into a standard, you need adoption. You want lots of people to be using it. That's the key. That's ultimately what you want. So how do you get people to use it? You don't just give them a spec and say, you should use this. That's the worst thing. This is where a lot of standards have failed. You need to build an ecosystem around this. And so you see outreach and open source development over here. This is how we sort of bootstrap this process. So uh, to, to increase adoption, we do a lot of outreach. You know, I'm always out there talking. Lots of other people are out there talking and giving, giving talks and, and doing stuff online about, um, about all the benefits here of Cloud Native Geo. And we have open source development, we fund this, or people do it, champions do this in their spare time, to add to the software ecosystem, to add to the implementations. When users go out there and they see this big software ecosystem of tooling that they can use, this is why Stack and COGS have been successful, because it's, you can use it right away. Like early on, there was servers and there was data catalogs of Sentinel and Landsat data that you could use and people were benefiting from early on. Uh, so adoption, um, I know I'm running out of time so I'll probably, I, there's probably like 40 slides left in this deck, but that's okay. Um, a lot of this has been touched on. So there's a lot of users, um, there's a lot of public stack APIs out now uh, that have been mentioned. The, I'll just point out the last one here, Stack Index. Uh, that's a great resource. You can go there and you can learn about all these, all these public catalogs. The Earth Search one is one that we maintain at Element 84 for the Sentinel-2 data. And there's an official USGS Landsat data. Uh, but the Microsoft Planetary Computer is a great example. It's because it's a, it's, they've really taken a top-down approach where they're ingesting all this data and making all of the data available in a stack API in a really consistent way. Um, and there's nothing quite like it. Like I hope that we can see something like this on AWS for all their public data sets at some point, but right now the planetary computer is kind of the, it's really the, a great example of an open source version 
of Google Earth Engine. So let me, oh, and this is a cool thing too. A, a couple years ago, somebody from USGS Astrogeology reached out and they're like, oh yeah, we're using Stack for Jupiter and Mars. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Like, you, you know, you could do that? And they, and they use QGIS and stuff. I had no idea. Uh, it was really cool to see that, uh, that these standards can be used for, uh, for other planets as well. Um, so Pete talked about the software ecosystem. There's just a couple slides here. Stack utils is, is kind of, it's not, it's not the end all and be all. Like people, anybody can make you know, software, but this is an open GitHub org that people can add to and contribute to and you can move your project there if you want it. Uh, and there, there's a, ho a whole lot of really, really great repositories there. Uh, PyStack client is one of the main things that users would be interested in because it's for searching APIs. Uh, and, and Pete had talked about Stack Tools. You can go and watch the recording of, of his. Uh, so lastly, I want to talk about this concept of cloud-native geospatial workflows. I really want people to stop thinking in terms of files. So this here is your typical, I've been using this image for a long time. This is like your typical image of like a scientist's work directory. It's like they vomited, you know, on their hard drive. And if something happens, like, right, they they leave and, and now somebody comes in and they're like, okay, well, which version, which version was published here? <laughs> okay, is it, is it final version class? Is it final version final because it's got the word final in there twice? <laughs> like, which one is it? And you won't know because there's no provenance information. There's nothing there. So, um, because the way that they used to do things, would do things is, okay, I have an algorithm, it's gonna read in a file and it's gonna generate another file and you're kind of relying on them knowing what produced what. So start thinking of things, rather than writing algorithms that work on data, write algorithms that work on metadata. So the metadata, in this case stack, right? You have stack item or one or more stack items and that goes into your function. And that contains a complete characterization of the data including the location of that data and how to access it. And the beauty here is that your workflow can do whatever it wants. It can, it can fetch the data if it needs to. It, maybe it doesn't need to. Maybe it only needs to fetch certain pieces of the data. Maybe it's adding an asset. Maybe it's adding to the metadata. And then on the other end, it spits out more metadata. That's a modified version or maybe a new item altogether. And this way, you can really easily track data provenance because of the workflow. This algorithm can add in the source stack item. It can add in lineage information. It can add in version information really easy. And then you output it and you have that metadata record. It's lightweight and maybe your algorithm has pushed data up to the cloud and you have an indication of where that's located. So I'm gonna leave you with this. Cloud native geospatial is really the foundational architecture for this concept of a queryable earth. If you're not using cloud native geospatial, if you're building services, you should really rethink what you're doing. Now this isn't to say that you shouldn't build services, but if you build services, build them on top of a cloud native geospatial architecture where the service is directly accessing the data. This has a lot of power to it um, and it's, it's, it's the wave of the future, I would say. So thank you.